appreciate your, uh, your attendance today and uh, your interest in this very important subject. Uh, I am Marie Bache. I'm the director of the Academic Success Center. Um, and I'm proud to say I have with me the staff uh, from the Academic Success Center. Uh, we have Jill Gray here, who is the Academic Support Liaison, uh, who helps me uh, coordinate uh, mostly the uh, tutoring in humanities and social sciences and computers. And Stuart Tinturin, who's also academic support liaison, helps me more in the science and math area, uh, also with technology. Um, there's you know, quite a bit of an overlap in what they do, but they're, they're, those are their areas, areas of focus. And also I have Laura Reale Foley, who was formerly a math instructor here at the, at the college, but has brought her talents to the ASC in helping uh, work in working with students who uh, uh, have documented disabilities. Uh, she meets with them for what we call direct strategies, um, which is targeted tutoring for students who um, come with um, special academic challenges. So um, that's been very successful for us. And uh, anyway, I'm glad to have everybody here uh, from the center because uh, it's good for um, all of you to get to know everyone who works down there and supports me. Um, what's her purpose today? Um, we we want to just provide some suggestions for faculty on uh, how to embed practical learning tips and strategies into your lectures, into your classroom activities, uh, in, in such a way that it won't get in the way of your learning objectives and goals. Uh, so if you think about the fact that we have a college success course at the, at, at the school, it's a three credit course, and uh, you know that everybody thinks, well, that's a wonderful thing because it has great um, uh, ideas for students and it helps orient them as to what they should do uh, to succeed in, in school. The problem is not that many students are taking that course. There's only about three to four sections running of this course every uh, semester. Um, so th the, the idea behind this uh, workshop is to figure out ways in which you as faculty can take sort of pieces of the college success course and weave them into your class every day in a way, and I, Jill mentioned this, uh, that I thought was really funny when we were preparing for this. It's almost like um, sneaking fiber into your diet, you know. So in a way that you, you don't, and the students and, uh, don't really know what's going on. It's sort of part of what, what you do every day, and you're modeling um, these strategies and putting them to work and, and applying them to, to your content, the material that you're covering. Um, so, but we also want to give you all a chance to share ideas, so we don't want to just be up here saying this is what you should do and, you know, this is, uh, um, you know, how it you know, should be done. Um, but really the goal isn't so much to think about how to make you a better instructor. Of course, that'll, that'll be the, uh, the um, that's always the ultimate goal. But really our primary concern is how to help students become better students. So how can you help students become better students? So just as a little discussion, and we're not going to break up. We were thinking that maybe we'd break up into pairs and talk about this uh, in, in small groups. But just to think about some, a few of these questions, um, uh, first of all, what makes a student successful? Just I wanted to hear from everybody. What, what do you think makes a student successful? They show up for class. They show up for class, OK. <coughs> Anyone else? They participate a lot. Mm -hmm. They come to class. They're actively involved. Next question, yes. Student perceives success based on their grade. Right, they right. That's a, great point. that's a very good point. So um, that's their perception of success. So what's how do you define success? That's the I mean that's that's true. Often students look at their grade, yeah. but then there's often a disparity well, at between some level based on their grade is sure. a successful uh, understanding of the, the content. Mm -hmm. of the course. So mm -hmm. yes, based on their grades to some level, I define success in that way. Mm -hmm. Well, it includes the successful achievement of the learning outcomes, which yeah. of course is tied to their grades, but since you're talking Correct. so much lately about learning outcomes, right. you could say that a successful student achieves those grades. And of course our students are thinking, outcomes? I don't know what that means. <laughs> I just want the grade. So it's interesting to think about. And then another thing, Think, and we don't have to answer this all right now, but what do you think is your role as a faculty member in helping students achieve success? You know, well, maybe we just. Support. Yeah. Okay. 
but something to think about. Just engaging, sort of them, the engaging them. Okay. Yeah. Having them participate. Having them just participate. Not just sit there. Yeah. Not just sit there. Absolutely. So the guided practice is what Madeline Hunter used to say. Guided. The old days. I like that. So, not just sit there, you say. <laughs> Does this look familiar? That's Ray's class now. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, you know, we're often frustrated by, and this is obviously an exaggeration, although I've walked by a couple classes, I've seen a, a couple of heads on the desk, you know, or back like this, you know. So this is uh, something that often frustrates our instructors. Uh, how do we get them more engaged and interested um, and in the process and, as we talked about, to be more successful? Um, David Arendale was the former president of the National Association for Developmental Education and considered one, the, one of the founding fellows of the profession. This is a kind of a long quote, so. My role as a teacher is to construct a learning environment that is conducive for my students to explore, learn, and develop new knowledge and skills. I began my teaching career reproducing the same traditional pedagogy that I experienced as a college student. It was heavily focused on lecture with little interaction from the students within the class and diminished engagement with the course material. Unconsciously, I expected my students to experience college in the same manner as I had done. So um, does this sound familiar? Doesn't work doesn't work and you know most of our students uh, they didn't grow up in that sort of academic environment uh, where they had a mentor a parent or a brother or sister or possibly came from a high school that really emphasized a lot of these success skills that we were all almost expecting them to have and, and haven't you heard in the hallways people saying they should know this by now you know I don't have time to to, to cover this and and the, the truth is that not a, lot, not a lot of our students have that, some of these skills uh, that would seem very obvious to all of us at, when, we, when we went through, through college. Not for me, but for <laughs> a lot of people here. And, uh, and yet they're not so obvious to our students. So what Arendelle and others who sort of I, um, support the idea that really this type of work and uh, looking at student success strategies in the classroom, um, uh, the, some of the themes with, um, with regard to this should, should be is like um, having to do with these verbs, I should call them. Uh, de debriefing, sharing, modeling, reflecting, problem solving, collaborating, guiding, diversifying, and demonstrating are some of the, the I would say, goals that an instructor might have within the class um, to, to help support student success. And we're going to get into more detail about what are, you know, specific examples of all this, but um, main thing for, for Arendelle is he, he's, a, he's a big proponent of debriefing and modeling in the class um, and spending time not just sort of um, going over things and moving on, but having a discussion about um, what, what students have learned and what they've had difficulty with, okay, and some of their challenges. Okay, Stuart. Thank you. As we were preparing for this workshop, it made me think about what strategies am I currently using and, and some self-reflection um, as we were preparing for this workshop. Yeah, this title, What Smart Students Know, actually comes from a book of the same title by Adam Robinson. And he comes up with 12 questions that smart students ask. And what we would love to do as an instructor is help the students internalize these questions to make them better learners. For example, what's the purpose of this? So when the student first comes in, he's sitting down. How does this lecture tie in with the course material? Um, what do I already know about this? 
Uh, do I know this from a previous lecture, maybe from a previous course? If they can make links to what they already know, it'll solidify the material more for them. What's the big picture? Well, how does this fit in with the whole concept of the course, this particular lecture, for example? What's the instructor going to say next? If the student has read the chapter ahead of time, that's an easier question for them to ask themselves because they've already had some familiarization with the material. Questions like, so what, what if? Those are very powerful. Even Einstein asked himself that question, what would the universe look like if I was sitting on a light beam? What does this remind me of, dude? Again, you know, have I seen this before? What's important here? Not everything in the lecture is going to be equally important, so this will help the students try to glean what's the most important aspects of the lecture. How does this relate to what I already know that ties in, you know, what we said earlier? How can I paraphrase and summarize what the instructor just said? That's very powerful because if the student could put it into their own words, then they know that they've learned the material well. This is, uh, well, I could speak to this one, right. actually. The uh, um, next question I would say is encouraging self-assessment, which is, how am I doing? And I think that in, in all that you can do, if you can push the students to think about how, you know, how are they, what, what progress are they making in class? Um, as a matter of fact, I just got this this morning from Jeff, uh, that he likes to, to, uh, to ask students how would they characterize their participation, attendance, grade, and effort. And rather than um, giving students a progress report that you hand to them and say, this is how you're doing, it's better to ask students to evaluate themselves and say, you know, this, this, That's is, right. how, this is how I feel I'm doing, and it's much more effective that way rather than just telling them. Instead of students coming to you and saying, how am I doing, how am I doing, this gets them to be more independent. They can sort of track their own progress. Good test taking skills begin with sound test preparation. Well, what are some things that maybe we could suggest to our students? Maybe prepare their own study guides to share with classmates so it becomes interactive and maybe they'll get more out of it that way. Ask students to prepare exam questions and include the best ones on an exam. That would encourage them to become more active in the process. And also, uh, it would be easier for us, too, if we incorporated some of their questions on the exam. We don't have to come up with as many, perhaps. Uh, I'm sure a lot of students ask, what's, what's the exam format? Uh, obviously, they would study differently if it was a multiple choice exam or short an answer or essay. So if they know in advance what the format's going to be, it helps them focus their studying better. Provide practice exams. Some instructors would do that. Uh, I know a lot of instructors don't allow the students to have their own exams, you know, to take them home. Perhaps you could share them in class and then collect them afterwards. Or maybe some instructors have on file in the library previous exams that you can encourage your class to look at. In class review sessions, assign small groups the responsibility of teaching the rest of the class a key concept. If they can teach the other students, then they know the material well. And what has worked for your students in the past? Get them to be interactive and to be, take an active part of the process. Post test debriefing session. After you get back to the exam, you can hear some cries. Some people will be pleased. Perhaps you could just ask, you know, what worked for you? Did you, how many hours did you study? Did you study with somebody else? Did you study alone? Um, what was your approach during the exam? Did you stay up the night before studying or did you take a break the night before? And different students can share their experiences. Those that did well and, and those that didn't do well too. Uh, and, and maybe you can encourage them, for example, before an exam, <clears throat> excuse me, to get enough rest, to get proper nutrition, exercise, things like that.
great site. You can either make your own or you can um, put in a specific area and it would come. Let's see. Does anybody want to give me one? Microbiology. Oh, <laughs> Has anybody ever seen this before? No. Could even assign that as homework. Yeah. Right. Could be a homework assignment to go to the website yeah, and then have great. a discussion at the next class. Maybe each student could share one thing that they found most helpful. And the next one is called howtostudy.org. This one is, is great because it incorporates lots of other sites. It, it's basically like a central place where you can find all the different study field sites that are out there. Okay, let me see if I can do this clicker. Okay, I can go. Okay, now I'm going to talk about note taking a little bit. And we, we all agree that the goal of students taking notes is actually to have them take notice, pay attention to what you're saying and try to remember it. If a student sits there and just writes down word for word what you've said, chances are they're not really hearing or digesting anything, right? Um, so what we're suggesting and what's worked well for me when I was teaching is have a discussion with the students and maybe model note taking. I'm sure a lot of you do that already, but talk to them about active listening, tell them you need them to ask questions, give them time for questions. One idea we came up with in our prep session was have everybody, if some students are too shy to maybe ask important questions, have them all write a question on a note card or something, then collect the note cards and read the questions yourself. Um, and just make sure that the students' notes are meaningful to themselves. Each student might have their own style of taking notes. Some people do well with pictures or symbols. Um, this writing in the margins is an accepted way of taking notes in a math class. You just put the formulas on one side of your paper and the it's actually quite a big margin on the other side where you have the example. So if you just generally teach them and even maybe even write on the board that way, the formula, the equation, and then the examples of how to work it out. Um, and then I think all of these rewriting, reviewing, reciting, reducing, one of the things that makes notes work is if you review them, if you go back and look at them, highlight them, you know, condense them. Later in the semester, the, um, later in the semester, you may understand some material differently, so your notes should get shorter and shorter for previous weeks. Let's see. Um, this is a new term for me, SQ4R. 
preview the reading, ask students to preview their reading in advance. You could actually assign it. <laughs> it doesn't always work, but, but uh, so that means survey, question, read, read review, write, and reduce. <laughs> and review. And re and re a lot of R is not recite. Another thing that I've used a lot is like a flow chart or a table or a diagram. Again, from one class to the next, maybe you give them a diagram and say, we're going to fill this out on Thursday. So they're puzzled in their mind a little bit. And maybe they'll look at the book and start to see how it fits together. Um, and then when they actually fill out the diagram, it maybe helps them bring, see that big picture of how the concepts are fitting together. This is key. And you know, as the learning specialist, as Marie said, I work with the students with disabilities. And sometimes um, they are asking for PowerPoints that the teachers are using in class. So the teachers who have the students with learning disabilities who agree to do that have been routinely putting their PowerPoints on, on Blackboard so that the students can use it. But they don't do it just for that student. They make it available for the, all the students and everybody benefits. Not every student uses it, but it's there if they want to go back to review the lecture. And if I could just interject, and one, one thing to be careful with PowerPoint is that you might have these beautiful slides up there, and then the students, rather than listen to you, they're trying to recreate your PowerPoint, and uh -huh. they're not listening. So if you can relieve that stress and say, I'm going to have these for you up on Blackboard Vista, um, you know, really, one of, the, uh, one of the things that happens often is you might print the slides and like Stewart has Stewart it, yeah. Yeah, right? you can do that. But the problem with this is that the students think that they have to limit their notes to those five lines in some way, or that their notes have to be text only, you know, where notes can be pictures or mapping yes. or some of the symbols. So that, that, you know, if you're going to do this, that's great, but you want to tell students, you know, this is just a guideline, but you know, we still want you to take your own notes. Your own notes have to mean something to you. So I often see students when you have PowerPoint, they're just writing down everything that's on the PowerPoint. And, and, and that's, to me, is, um, it, it's not effective for the student when they get home. Sure. So. Will you be able to, to give us copies of this PowerPoint? Yes. Oh. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Certainly. Yeah. Absolutely. OK, one more slide on notes. Um, one way to help students learn to take good notes is to have a discussion about notes at some point during your class. And one of the ways is maybe have, a, have them at some point share notes with a partner and discuss with each other how their notes could each be improved by the other's notes. You could also ask them, look back at your notes. What did I, you know, what am I talking about? What's the big picture? Make sure you have this concept written down. I mean, I always find that if you really want something on the student's notes, you put that thing on the board. Um, maybe you'll have a student who would be willing to volunteer to put their notes on the document camera. I've even had a situation where somebody's actively taking notes while somebody else is talking. Maybe one student's making a presentation. You have somebody else taking the notes and everybody can see what that person's writing down. This is the idea about asking questions. And this is a popular idea in high schools, having an exit pass. I think it works well. We talked about having it here today, but we decided against it. But you, write, you have students write down, just at the end of the time, what three things they remember most, or what three things they learned today. And then that's in their head. If they have any, as they walk out of the room, that's the last thing they remember. And you get to look at it and see if there's misconceptions. Say somebody learned something that is wrong, then you know, and you can go back the next day and, and correct it. So this is good from the teaching standpoint as well as from a learning standpoint. 
And now we're going to talk about time management. <laughs> and we don't allow any time for yes. switching the microphone. Yes. We don't have time for that. Students will say that a lot, you know, um, that they don't have time to prepare. They don't have time to get ready. Um, but if you actually make them aware that using some time management skills, there might be a little bit work up front, but in the long run, it will actually save them time. If you can get them uh, sold on that idea, then they might actually implement some of the ideas and strategies. And we could even give them a couple uh, simple ideas to get them started with time management. One idea is that you could um, have your syllabus set up in the style of a calendar. Then maybe the first page of your syllabus is set out with the squares of an actual monthly calendar and you might have plotted out, again for that visual learner, they could, oh next this Thursday and then next is the first draft and then next Tuesday I have the second draft and then the following Wednesday is the first quiz. That might help them to plan out their time. You might also have them use that calendar to plot out when are they going to do homework. You know, they, you might give them a couple moments in class or assignment where they have to take that calendar that you've given them for that month and they have to write down what they're doing that. You know, if they have, you know, swim practice or if they have band or if they have a job when are they going to study? And then make that a homework assignment. They've told you that on Tuesdays from 6 to 8, I'm going to study for this class, and then on Saturday mornings. You know, that would actually be productive. Um, you can also encourage the use of planners. Um, I meant to bring my own planner, uh, but I've done that. I've shown, you know, actually brought my planner that I use and show that to them because there's so many different styles they may not be uh, familiar with. Uh, there is a student handbook here at the college. You could even have a stack of the student handbooks available, hand them out the first day of class with the syllabus, um, but so that, and, and get them familiar with that. Review the, the, the academic calendar with them when things are due. Uh, you may also discuss with everyone um, how much time does it take to do things. Uh, my son has um, an issue with procrastination, and I'm sure that many students do. And some of it, I think, is an inability to, to judge, to figure out how long something takes. So one tactic is to start from the back and make them work forward. So if this is due, you know, in two weeks, well, I, I, have, so, I have time. I don't have to do anything now. But what could you do? What, what would you have to do the day before it's due? And what would you need to do the week before it's due? And therefore, what do you need to do the two, two weeks before it's due? And have them break that task into small chunks. Um, do you have ideas? What, what ideas do you have that you have actually um, given to students for time management? Have you found something that, that, that you give to students that works? I want to hear from you. I built um, into the syllabus. I apologize for coming in and out. I tried to come get some other things. Anyway, um, I, I build kind of uh, uh, points in the syllabus. Like right now for my capstone course, they have a major research project. We started on day one and with a librarian coming in. And then two weeks later, they had to have a bunch of research done that they would come and they would present on. And then a few weeks later, there was a bibliography, annotated bibliography due and, and, and a proposal and, and that kind of thing. So just having them kind of arrange out that way works so much better than what I tried to do in the past, saying research paper due on the last day of class. That's great. So J Jeff took this large assignment and he broke it down into doable chunks. And he actually gave the students uh, those small chunks a piece at a time. And it sounds like it was, it was making the task more doable. Yeah. I do something similar to what you said is, is backward planning and all my classes always have team projects so we'll go backwards and plan this is when you're and like I, I give them like a schedule in your first meeting you should be discussing this in your second meeting you should be discussing this this is when your powerpoints are due this is when uh, you should start thinking of your creative ideas this is when you should be rehearsing right up until the day. Excellent. Yeah, Rosemary. In my 0 and 5 class, um, 
the test really reflects the review that I give. It's, it's exactly the same thing, only different numbers. So what I do is I give it to them at a certain point and say, now you should be able to do this much by this date, because we'll be at that point. And then today I said, okay, now we have covered these topics, these problems can be done. I said, don't wait until the night before to do the review, because if you hit something, you can either come to me during one of my office hours, or you can go to the learning yeah. center, right. because they have the answers too. I give them a sheet of answers. So it helps the people in the learning, not that you need the answers, but you can right away see if they're doing it correctly. But I don't want them to wait till the last minute. In fact, when I was teaching at Glasgow Mary High, the director would not allow us to give extra help the day before the exam. Mm -hmm. the test. Mm -hmm. He says, we, you're not allowed. You will give it any day before, because they have every single week to see you. So we weren't even allowed to stay the day before. Because he said, then they'll wait. That's right. <laughs> you know? that so be. that's why I'm encouraging them. Now, you can do this much. You can do this much. Mm -hmm. And I'm finding that a lot of them are coming to me saying, you know, I do need help in this much. But again, it's up to them. You know, I'm there, and as you know, you, you know, you can be there. They have to come to you. Excellent. So yeah, we're not enabling them to use the last minute. It's particularly important for writing assignments. Mm -hmm. Jeff would agree that uh, if you start early, uh, if coming to the academic success center won't do any good if you're coming an hour before the papers. Right. Right. Uh, so you need time for revision and to make things better. So um, definitely helping them keep on stay on track with reminders. And you know, some of you might say, well, I'm, you know, they're in college. Do I, do I really need to do this? Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? Is that, yeah, I think going back to what we were talking about with our role, it's, it's, it doesn't take a lot of time from your class to, uh, to you know, in fact, I'm, I'm in a graduate class right now and my instructor just reminds us, you have a major project due, um, and he said, you know, he's Korean, and he said, uh, a Korean expression is, um, once you get started, you're halfway there. Mm -hmm. yes. and, exactly. that got, and that got yes. small going, like, That's you're right. right, you know? So he, you know, this is a graduate class, so he took the time to remind everyone you have, you have a certain amount of time left, and mm -hmm. you know it didn't, it didn't do a lot of harm. <laughs> Did I get it right? Yeah, it, it also you can help your students with. You know, a lot of times they'll look at the syllabus and say, "There's so much to do mm -hmm. yeah. for this class." You know, why do you give us so much work? Mm -hmm. And but if you if you find out what they're doing, they're trying to do all that work for the entire week the night before. So you could kind of uh, alleviate some of that anxiety uh, with them and also that kind of, you know, anger they have with you <laughs> by, by saying, like, I, I have my, uh, for one of my classes, a short story course, they read 100 pages a week. And that breaks down to about five stories. Mm -hmm. So they have five stories a week. Yeah, if you're going to try that the night before <laughs> class, you know, it's, it's going to be crazy. Mm -hmm. But if you break it up over the weeks, mm -hmm. can you do one story a day? Yeah, it's a lot more manageable, and it doesn't seem like a whole lot of work. So it helps them to, to, to feel less anxiety, but also to feel better about the work that you're giving them. Exactly, and to add on to what Jeff is saying, um, students do have a lot of anxiety. You can help the student to alleviate that by verbalizing their anxiety. You could even say, well, what, what causes you, what, what issues do you have with time, or what prevents you from getting things done? Let's say a student says, well, you know, the reading, the reading takes so much time. I, I don't have that much time. I can't read that whole book. You could give them some strategies. You could teach them about skimming. And you could even skim uh, a couple pages or a chapter together. You could teach them about using the chapter summary at the end of the chapter. Uh, suggest that they read the chapter summary first so they've got the five most important points in their head so that when they're hearing the lecture or then reading the chapter, those ideas will pop, come to the surface, rise to the top as being important. Um, there's also electronic resources here. Um, there is a calculator uh, that helps. Um, so you can plug in uh, the date the assignment is due, and uh, then you will plug in when you believe you'll start the assignment. You go through the different subjects. And it's kind of what with Jeff, Jeff and Rosemary, um, Nancy were talking about was either backing up and it's giving you an outline, giving you a visual representation, taking the large project, breaking it down into steps, chronologically, what can you do next, what you, can you do next. You know, if you're climbing a mountain, it looks awful big, but if you just think about what's my first step, if you take it one step at a time, then um, it, makes, um, it makes it 
feel. Um, Okay, and then but it has links to other sites like the Owl for Do website for writing. If, it's, if they're at the point where they're supposed to be working on the citation, it will link right to the to the page on MLA. So, so it's nice that it introduces them to other study field sites that are out there. Um, and, the other and the other was the Gardner site. It's from and again, I, I, we have this on a list. Yes, the, the handout has these um, websites for you. The College Experience Student Center. This is browsing by topic um, with time management. They have other calendar, flashcard, study tools. I'm not sure this is working. But anyway, you get the idea. There are, there's podcasts also, you know, and with students today, using technology in your favor might get, the, the student might, might listen to it if it was on their iPod. You know, they might, they might hear it in a different format. This morning on the early show, they were saying that um, telephones, you know, nobody answers their phone anymore. Everything is done by text message. You know, how, how many uh, instructors could have a, um, a text list? You could send out, you know, reminders or something using technology. Okay. Let's see, what am I doing? Reading between the lines. Um, other study techniques um, is that we could provide students with preview questions before the reading um, to get them thinking. Um, or better yet, we could ask the student to come up with a preview question. Um, in fact, as we're reading through this slide, let's say this slide would be the content. Let's see if someone can come up with a preview question. Uh, by the time we get to the bottom here, that maybe if, we, if you gave that as an assignment, say, well, here's our chapter, here's our page, have the students come up with possible preview questions for the next class that they could ask about. Um, also to get them in, interested in the reading. How can we get them to delve into the book, to open up the book, to read it? You could start with um, an excerpt. You could um, have in class assignment where you might break them into small groups and assign a paragraph uh, or a section of the book uh, or of the chapter and let that small group read that section and kind of assess and kind of pique their interest um, and they could share that with with the class and so uh, they'll say well what's going to happen next well yeah. read the chapter right yeah like the trailer, the trailer. Um, you can also provide background about the author um, other context, uh, what society uh, did they come from, what decade, uh, where was this written. Um, if you give them some of that background, that they might have something that they could relate to. It helps them give a larger context of the reading assignment. Um, YouTube, and again, the internet is great for this. Uh, our students are so um, used to using the technology that maybe they would Encourage them to Google. Well, well, what did, you know, Einstein say, or what, you know, uh, uh, process did Hemingway use? And if they did their own Googling and 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 did some of uh, some background uh, checking, they might again find some interesting matter. Uh, we could also have the students write about their reading through essays or journals. Um, this will encourage participation. Um, some students may have never written a journal before, but this could be their first time, and this might give them participating in the process. And we're going to go on to the next topic of stress and stress busters. Stress. What can we do about that? Um, we, all, we see it in their faces, and 
we hear them sort of talking about it in the hallway, but do we ever address it? And I think a lot of us think, well, gee, I'm not a psychologist, or I'm not a therapist, so I really can't get into talking about stress. But you really can, and I mean, you can even share your, you know, you don't have to get into stories, but you can, your personal stories, but you can share how maybe you might have coped with stressful situations in the past. Because I think they often see us as like, well, we, we just got here, we're experts, and everything has always went run smoothly for us. But I think if they could see how we also struggled and we had issues and there's times in our lives when we weren't balancing the stress, especially in college, I think that would be helpful. Um, I actually heard about this at, the, at Daniela and Kevin's uh, presentation last week that there's a study out there that showed that if students wrote about their math exams before they took it um, and about the stress that they were feeling or the anxiety, actually right before the exam, not even, I'm suggesting it would be the week before, but maybe a few minutes before the exam, it actually showed that the students performed much better, which I think is kind of fascinating, um, just getting out the, those feelings and, and putting them on paper. Um, Often what you see right before an exam is students outside um, talking about you know, what material they covered or they didn't study. There's nothing worse than hearing another student say, did you, did you study this part? I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. You know? But if you could spend a, a few minutes before a test, for instance, and just helping them to calm down, you could even play some classical music as they're walking in, perhaps, before, they, before you start. Um, you can even t spend a few minutes talking about what's going on in other classes and you know, how are they juggling um, the pressures from their other classes. Um, I think they would find that uh, very helpful. Um, again, your own coping strategy. Th there's this video, which I won't show now, but I have it on the uh, handout, which is a, a PowerPoint that you can share with students on, on stress management. And it, it really encompasses a lot of what we've already talked about. And I, um, so you might want to take a few minutes to uh, to either show it in class or you can just have students go out, see it on their own and write about it. Um, we often talk about assessments and tests and that they have to be the kind that you hand in during that hour and 20 minutes and you know everyone's quiet and no one can talk to each other. But there's other ways of assessing students' learning that maybe not be, are not as stressful for students, um, such as, uh, mock trials of uh, the villains in a story or debates between figures in history. Um, I think you use Jeopardy, right, um, for science? I use academic relay races, and actually just before I came <laughs> here, I just developed microbiology bingo for oh, a review oh, session yes. for next, yeah. next Wednesday. I have yeah. a list of 100 terms that are related to this next section. Great and uh, they'll all get bingo sheets. They'll pick which terms they're actually gonna put on their card. They don't know which ones they'll pick. And then um, if they win the, you know, win the bingo, um, you know, they'll get extra credit points. That's, That's great. That's great. That's great. Yeah. So that'll be next Wednesday at wow. 10 in the morning. <laughs> at 10 in the morning, and the re you said relay races? Or? Academic relay race, I do an anatomy and physiology where I have um, almost like worksheets active learning type activities and they get, once their small group completes that activity, they bring it up to the score, make sure that it's at least 90% correct, then they'll get the next activity. So we have like four or five different groups working all uh, in tandem but at different levels, so they're still getting something at their own wow. pace. If there's, and, and the, the tasks get harder, um, so yeah. it's like passing the baton and then they get the next. Mm -hmm. and you know, that equates to, however, the amount of work that that group gets equates to extra bonus points for the exam. Oh, well that's great. Mm -hmm. And then that really gets them into it. It gets them motivated, yeah. it gets them working, it gets them really trying to find the answers instead of uh, just sitting back waiting for somebody else in the group to facilitate the uh, completion yeah. of that task. And we all know how students re respond to games, right Jeff, when we had the our, our own Jeffrey, Pi Theta Kappa, everybody gets into it. So, uh, and it's fun, and, but you're, you're still learning. You're not, what's that? Family oh, is it Family Feud? Okay, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, but anything, yeah, anything like this, it's fun, and yet you're still learning. You're not taking really time from your class. I mean, you, you could say, well, that's a waste of time, but it's not, it really isn't. You can also do it by setting a task. Uh, like a, um, one thing I, I do with, 
one of my classes, uh, uh, again, the short story classes, at the end of the semester, after they've read uh, seven, seven books by seven different authors, mm -hmm. I then get them into groups and they have this, they have to pretend that they're putting together, they work for a publishing company and they're putting together an anthology. Yeah. And so they have to look back over all the stories they've done and they come up with, you know, they can only include like 20 stories or something like that. So there's a lot they have to leave out and they have to be able to then to pitch the story, pitch the, the anthology idea to the publisher, which is me, and, uh, and the rest of the class, because we all vote. And then they, they have to pitch it and they have to say what they're including and why, mm -hmm. and what they're not including and why. And, and then at the end of it, there are prizes and that kind of thing. But it's all, by the end of it, they've reviewed everything and, and, you know, and, and really thought about why, why they liked certain stories and why not others, and what was yeah. valuable about literature. Mm -hmm. Again, sneaking the fiber in, like we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, round robin exercises, when, when uh, you have students, one group starts the paragraph and the next one continues, and the next one continues, so something along those lines. Pass the marker, I um, went to a presentation, the a math teacher um, talked about how he had, well, they had set up, a, they have boards all over the room, not just at the front and they would have students get up and work on a problem together. <coughs> and if the student, w if one student would get stuck, they would pass the marker to the next student. And that student would continue the, pa the, the problem and they'd pass and so on and so forth. So everybody working together, no one's put on the spot. Everyone's learning, it's fun. I think it's important to remind the students, at least in the discipline that I teach, that it's not as complicated necessarily as it seems at first glance, because then they get very anxious with microbiology. They're really complex topics, but if you think about things that you do every day that are analogous to that, and you know, so we have these little contests sometimes about, well, who can come up with a scenario that's similar? And uh, we, we've come up with um, going through turnstiles, you know, transport proteins and membranes are like turnstiles when you, you know, all, all these really interesting things that they do normally in life that can be used to explain really complex mm -hmm. topics. Just yesterday I was telling a student about, you know, interferons, she didn't get it. And then I said, it's like the May Day, the SOS signal. I'm going down, save yourself. <laughs> and, and she's like, oh, I get that. Oh. And, and, and now she'll, she'll be, hopefully be able to respond. I wish she had been by my biology teacher. <laughs> it's the May Day signal. Yeah. I'm going down, save yourself. <laughs> so. I finally get that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we're all playing. That's a wonderful yeah. thing to do as well. It uh, brings everything to life for the student. Um, learning styles. We, we always talk about learning styles, and I think a lot of times our reaction is, well, geez, I can't change my style or what I'm doing for everyone in the room, you know, that's, that's impossible. But the, 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 the fact is you really don't as long as you mix it up. And this goes according in accordance with the universal instructional design principles, which basically states that your, you, what your goal is to create a barrier-free learning environment for all students. And in doing so, you're, you're going to accommodate everyone's needs, whether it's a student who has a, a, a learning disability, a student who's a visual learner, or the kinesthetic learner, or the auditory learner, and what have you. So if you if you mix things up, and that works for lots of things in sports, it works, and and in life, you know, to have moderation, to have different um, de forms of delivery, you'll keep students more engaged, more interested, and then you're also going to help them to learn, because um, the fact is that not everyone can um, does well in response to the the tr traditional lecture format. Um, that, as a matter of fact, they, um, studies show that most instructors have more of that um, uh, learning style that responds to the lecture um, format. Our students uh, are actually quite opposite to that. And they, you know, there, there's um, uh, studies that suggest your learning style changes as you grow older, um, which is true. You become more sort of read-write oriented versus visual. Um, and uh, so you have to keep that in mind when you're looking at our students to you know, think, geez, I'm, I'm being perfectly <coughs> fair and I'm organized and I have everything in an outline form. What's the problem? And my, my PowerPoints are, you know, all there, they're clear, but yet you're not reaching them. And I go back to that slide that everybody was asleep, you know. 
<laughs> that's what might happen to you. Um, <coughs> so you, uh, you would use, also find uh, different ways of assessing students. So uh, on an exam, um, you know, you, you mix it up. You have multiple choice, short answer, essay. Um, maybe one <coughs> exam is a take home. The, the next one um, might be something that they, students work together on. Um, uh, so in, in, even in the assessment measure, you, you should mix it up. And how you deliver the material, of course, um, as we discussed before. Um, I can't stress enough the idea of helping, having students work together and working in pairs or in groups. Um, that's often where the, the true learning takes place is when students are working together and teaching each other concepts. Yes. Absolutely. You had mentioned that there's one of the top reasons that students succeed in college. And yep. is this a good chance to plug Nancy's uh, workshop next week? Or yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Monday at 1 30. Um, how to effectively use teams, how to put students into groups. That's great. I, I live by group work. Yeah, I do. Yes. I live by group work. Yeah. I also wanted to point out about your, thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> you get an extra credit. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to um, have a variety of uh, exams. I mean, I know I absolutely hate multiple choice questions. Mm -hmm. And so in one of my exams, I'll have more multiple choice, less short answer, and then I'll reverse it. And it's amazing to see mm -hmm. the students, how, how they do better when you reverse that yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and they, everybody look, I don't understand this, but everybody loves a take home. I think take homes are oh, a artists. lot of work, yeah. 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 but they love it. They love yeah. the take homes, and so I yeah. there's always a take home. And the truth is, they actually learn a lot more from the take home. Now they have to really dig deeper into the material. Yes. Um, so instructors might think, "Gee, that seems I'm not going to do that. It's too easy for them." But it really isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not only more work, but there. I I think that often you learn more from 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 uh, from a take home. Mm -hmm. Um, having more ch more of an opportunity to, to sit there with the question and, and digest it. And, 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 that, and maybe just not give a real boring take home with just regular questions, but at the end of the semester, similar to what Jeff does, um, I have them create their own companies and they have to answer questions pertaining to their own company using the concepts that we use in the class. Mm -hmm. Rather than just asking them the mm -hmm. questions, having them apply. Yeah. You know? And that moves up the uh, hierarchy. Of moving taxonomy, mm -hmm. and moving to where you're having students not just recite and recall right. and spit mm -hmm. information out, but evaluate and mm -hmm. recommend, and um, so you know, it, it improves your critical thinking skills. Well, I'd like to stress too that I think you can, for assessments, you can use some of the the, the variety of learning modalities, like the debate, say, or mm -hmm. the thing that you were talking about, where you the people had to pitch their anthology mm -hmm. choices. That could actually be an assessment. Rather than sure. just a game, sure. mm -hmm. uh, so that people are are using some of their other skills. Yeah. yeah. Um, and know your own style. Um, this is also in the handout, but there's a quick uh, online uh, assessment bar, which is the uh, uh, visual uh, oral A U R A L read write or kinesthetic. So there's other uh, assessments out there. The more you know about your own style, you're aware that you have one, and maybe the students in the, in the class may have another. Um, and maybe you don't take an assessment, but just be aware that where you are may not be where everyone else is. Mm -hmm. And it's actually helpful for students to know each other, that there are differences in the room as well. And what I tell students uh, uh, often is your instructor may not adjust their teaching delivery to fit your style, but you, what you need to do is find ways to um, make it happen for you outside of class. You know, so if if uh, you know your visual learner and the lectures are not uh, uh, catering to your style, you you might go home and create from your notes pictures and maps and graphs and what have you. Or when you're taking notes, uh, translate what the instructor is saying into something that's visual um, or auditory. You might go and um, read your notes into a tape recorder and play it back to yourself. So, in other words, you want to find things that you do on your own that are going to help 
help you. So don't expect that your instructor is going to necessarily do what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting that you do, and I know all of you will do, but you know, maybe that won't happen and maybe it won't be conducive to certain situations where a pure lecture format may, may have to be what you're going to see, so deal with. Um, and then um, in interdependence, the, the, the idea of a student not just being independent, but interdependent in that they not only um, uh, are, um, can, they can seek, they, they're seeking help and they're willing to give help as well. And so that's our goal, is to get the students to be uh, willing to seek help, which they're often unwilling to do. Um, and one thing you can do is help students form study groups, but not just say, oh, go form a study group outside of class, but maybe you facilitate that in some way in the class um, through group work. Um, I think that often comes sort of naturally. But you might say, oh, who wants to get together for a study group outside of class, you know, and you might um, send, the, send the students to the Academic Success Center. We have group study rooms uh, available for students, so you might suggest that they do that. Um, students are often very shy to ask the person next to them. So if, if you can help in that process, sort of match, matching students in some way, that, that would be helpful. Um, oh, in the office hours. You know, we always say, go, come to my office hours, you know. And I don't think our students realize, they th I think they think of office hours as like, you know, like you're there and it's like a dark place and, you know, with like you know, wind howling or something and uh, you're there, you know, it's just sort of waiting to grill them or something. And I think if you can make that the office hours seem more friendly and open and, and say, you know, when you come to office hours, this is, these are some of the things we might talk about. Um, after you hand back a paper, you, you can actually go over what are some of the things that you've done before with other students. I don't think students even realize that they can, if after they get a paper back, that they could actually talk to you about what went wrong, you know. Um, so try to bring the office hour thing to life for them. Um, can I share? Sure. I remember back when I was a freshman at the University of Wisconsin. And one of the history professors, and there was a, you have got to go to, you got to do the Red Zinger, you got to, you have to go to his office. I'm like, what are these, they're talking about? And so I decided I had to go to have an office visit. And I went in, and he had a hot pot of water and a, an array of teas mm -hmm. that you could choose. And, um, and that was kind of like, I don't, I don't know if it was really gimmick, or I think he just liked tea. But <laughs> it certainly, you know, and I did. I had to try Red Zinger, and um, you know, it really wasn't my cup of tea. It was pretty strong, yeah. but it, was, <laughs> it, was, it, it really got me to go. And after that, it was like it broke the ice. I wasn't afraid to go to office visits anymore. Mm -hmm. and, but yeah. it, was, it really yeah. it worked. Because when you come out of high school, going to the office was not a big thing. <laughs> I have to go to the office, you know, so you have to help change the student's mindset. This, this is really key. And I, 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 mean, I always, I tell my kids who are in college, more than you know, finishing high school, I tell them, I tell my students all the time, that, I mean, I, I just think it's so important for them to go to office hours. Yeah. You know, I mean, you've got that time to just go introduce yourself and just, yeah. you know, you know, talk about something. And, um, and I always found that that was really helpful. I don't know if somebody gave me that advice or if I just did it, but it was really helpful for me. And also when I wanted to get letters of recommendation, yeah. I, I, there were teachers who knew me and That's could really write a letter. Like, right. you know how it is when you write a letter of recommendation yeah. with somebody just like, well, the student was in my class and I guess I gave him this grade and it must have right. been okay. Right. You know, I mean, what, what more can you say? But when exactly. you get to know students, right. it's, it's much And better. then if you, if this, you as a student get to know the instructor in office hours. When you're in class, you're more likely to ask questions. You don't feel as intimidated. Right. So I was going to say that I do an extra credit point if they come to visit you oh, before the first exam. And if I have, if they, if they um, I have this RE. Instead of giving a really bad grade, I'll give them an RE on a paper. That means that they have to come and see me. Their grade was way too low, and you know they need some help. But but my point is, is that once once right. they've come in to see you, and they're back in the classroom, it's there's a just transformation. Right, right. They just feel closer to you, and again, yeah. like you said, yeah. uninhibited to speak. And yeah. Great idea. Yeah. I might try that. Yeah. It's it's really human. Really yeah. 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 It really works. So you're not it means we do, <laughs> but I just put an RE on it. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Rosemary. When I give back tests, I 
say, anybody would like to come and see me, and we'll go over the test individually, so you do all the wrong problems over again on a piece of paper, uh -huh. I will give you 10 points on your test. Oh, nice. So, you know, There's some and so in fact, I, again, we have to put it a little yes. bit in their court. Yeah. You know, I think we're all saying what we have to do. Yes, we have to be there sure. and do things, but they have to right. respond to it. Right, but know? if there's no. little things that you can do to make it a little more enticing, then that's okay. Yeah. Tour the library, have a librarian come to your class, and of course I have to plug the academic yeah. success center. Of course. But one thing that I want to say here is that not just send them there, like go to that place on the fourth floor, but uh, prepare them with the right expectations as to what a tutor is, what's the role of a tutor. Jennifer Thomason actually has in her syllabus where she actually gives gives you like steps as to what to do when you come into the writing center. Um, so it's not just go to the writing center, but you're going to do this, and this tutor is going to do that, and this is, this, is how, and this is how often you should go before you hand in the paper. So I mean, it's, it's not just send somebody down there blindly. And I can't emphasize this enough is if you provide us with your syllabi, syllabi and your assignments, mm -hmm. this way uh, tutors know what to expect and we can help. Um, better and, and, and the communication process will be much more effective. Um, you can send out an email at the beginning of the semester reminding us to send you your children. Yes, we're going to do that. You are? Yes, we are because it just, ca it just, came, up, it just came up today and we're going to do that every semester. So you're going to get that every semester. So in closing, so what are the benefits to you and to your students um, all that we talked about, you're having more of an active role in this process. Who wants to wrap this up? I guess on a very simple level, um, around this time of year, when students do occasionally start disappearing, <laughs> both the good students and the weak students, um, you feel bad yeah. because you wanted to hang on to them. And it's not you, it's life it just became absolutely overwhelming. So I would say an extraordinary benefit to, to a teacher is really to do all you can do to have that student bond and stay mm -hmm. and know it's important and feel as though they are learning and growing and succeeding. Mm -hmm. Because a student who, who persists is a student who makes the teacher Persist as well. That's great. That's good. That's good. I actually have a specific question that wasn't addressed yet. Um, you know, I do a lot of the things already that we talked about, and I have a lot of students, you know, aspiring to become nurses that are in my class, and I often have students whose primary language is not English, and I find that we could do, you know, notes on the board, different learning styles, active learning encourage resources and do all that, yet there's it still remains this disconnect between what we're speaking and teaching in English and how these students interpret and then transfer that information into notes or flashcards because I more recently realized that what we do on the board and what we do in class and then what, how it gets into their notes, I started saying, bring me your notebook. And then I found that everything was wrong or oh. jumbled mm -hmm. or, or yeah. misinterpreted, and, and I'm at a loss of how to handle that. Oh, wow, that's a, that's that's a, big, a tough that's question. That's a big bite to wrap up with, right? Well, um, I think it speaks to whether the student should be placed in a course if, they're not, if they don't have those sound language skills. Um, uh, you know, so that's, that's a difficult question. Um, it, it, I don't know, does anybody have any thoughts? Well, I recently discovered a uh, capability that we have in our own department. That we have a software program called Kurzweil oh. that will read the text to you. And it, you can have it, read it and translate it into Spanish. <laughs> Which, I mean, I, I haven't tested it to tell you how excellent the translation is. But it, in addition, it has two dictionaries. It has a Spanish dictionary and an English dictionary. So for a person whose English skills aren't great, you can it highlights the text that it's reading. Mm -hmm. You have earphones in, and any place that you're confused, you can slow down. But if you highlight a particular word, you can then look that word up in English and in Spanish. 
Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, so that's a so that's, a good that's something that course. that will work for some students. Yeah. And the and students who have discovered it mm-hmm. have really gone into yeah. it. I have a student in philosophy who's taking philosophy, and she came in my office in tears just about three weeks ago, and now she's totally caught up, and she feels in charge, and she's doing all mm-hmm. her reading well, on that software program. Mm-hmm. We also have um, conversation groups um, in the ASC on Fridays where students can come practice their English. We actually have a, a Spanish speaking class we have for those taking Spanish and wanting to increase their vocabulary and um, English speaking classes on Fridays and so uh, they could come and, and join our conversational group. And, and also there's an ESL department right, here and I'm right. sure that Carl would be happy to right talk with you about other ESL ideas yeah. that work. It's just many because times, a student, yeah, I'm sorry. Many times these students, primary language isn't Spanish. No, it could be another, right. yeah. Okay. And right. Kurzweil actually has, it has German, it has French, it has a number of languages, mm-hmm. it does. But I, I have one um, suggestion, which I think we mentioned, which is if you have regular check-ins during your lecture, um, you allow the person who's an, uh, not a native speaker to formulate the, the question. It's often, I think it's like they want to come up with the words, they don't know how to say them. And if, you know, how many times in class do you say, does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, I, I'm, I, I'm still trying to put together my question, which is, one thing you might do is stop and say, everybody take a minute to write down some questions. So I'm gonna take a minute, everybody think. Now, now do you have questions? So that not, and if the person doesn't feel uh, comfortable asking during class, they could s- save it for later. Yeah, the, um, the issue I was experiencing yeah. is that they think they're understanding, uh, and they, they say they don't have questions, and I'm sure, Professor, mm-hmm. I understand the topic, and right. can even speak it back yes. to some degree. But then they go back and they study their notes, and they're all Ooh. backwards. So even when they, 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 they'll still tell you, if you stop and you say, are you tell understanding me? me? And, and, and they, they can. And then later. And then later on, the test not so good, wow. so it got to the point where I said, bring me what you're using to study. Uh-huh. And that's when all of a sudden I realized that everything was uh-huh. backwards. Well, that's what, that's what we're talking about with looking at our notes, because that's really their, what they're doing for the intake. You know, they're, they're, if that's not going in the right way, um, there's a problem. So look at, I think the notes are really critical and how they take notes and um, what they're writing down. Um, sharing, thinking about maybe having someone take notes on the document ca- camera while, um, while you're speaking um, so that we're all, everybody's clear. This, this, um, and, it, and it can happen with a native speaker where you, they're not understanding what you're saying at all and they're not following you because it involves active li- listening skills which for a lot of, of our students and for, for a lot of us in general, <laughs> it's, it's a problem. <laughs> anyway. Yes. But anyway, I want to wrap this up. So, um, thank you for coming. And um, please take a handout with all the resources. And I will send all of you this PowerPoint if you're interested. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.